Hello, I'm Maria Blakey for Discovery Health. Our topic today is the diagnosis and treatment of obsessive compulsive disorder. I'd like to thank the University of Virginia School of Medicine for accrediting the program. I'd also like to thank Jazz Pharmaceuticals for providing the educational grant to make this program possible. Physicians and other healthcare professionals can earn free CME credit by registering online at discoveryhealthcme.com and taking the post test. All the graphics and references from today's program will also be available online. It's easy to log on, take the post-test, and earn free credit for the program, so log on today. We're fortunate to have a distinguished group of experts in the studio with us today to discuss the care of obsessive compulsive disorder. Dr. Stephen Rasmussen, Associate Professor of Psychiatry and Human Behavior, Brown University School of Medicine, Providence, Rhode Island. Dr. Helen Blair Simpson, Associate Professor of Clinical Psychiatry, Columbia University, New York City. And Dr. Lauren M. Coran, Professor of Psychiatry Emeritus, Stanford University School of Medicine, Stanford, California. Thank you each for joining us today. During the next hour, we will review the epidemiology of obsessive compulsive disorder, describe the socioeconomic consequences and disability associated with OCD, outline how to accurately diagnose OCD as it compares to other psychiatric disorders, discuss the pathophysiology of OCD and the role of serotonin, and discuss the treatment options for OCD. Now, the first step in correctly diagnosing and treating OCD is truly understanding the definition. Dr. Coran, please help our viewers understand how OCD is defined. Rhea, in the American Psychiatric Association's Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, it's now categorized as an anxiety disorder, one of the anxiety disorders, and it's characterized by obsessions or compulsions or both that are distressing and interfere with life functioning and should, in order to be clinically important, take at least an hour a day. Obsessions are intrusive, persistent, unwanted thoughts, images, urges that cause anxiety or distress, and compulsions are mental or physical acts that a person performs in order to reduce distress or prevent something unwanted or feared or bad from happening. Uh, perhaps the thing that people know the best are people who have to wash their hands excessively. And one of the things that people uh, perhaps don't know is, is that they can wash their hands for many different reasons. They can be afraid, for example, of uh, germs. And a classic example of that would be the person who was afraid that when they touched something red that it was blood and that they would get AIDS. Or they can be afraid of touching something that they might think is dirty, uh, like feces or urine. The other example would be a patient with um, a pathologic doubt or uh, checking rituals. These are patients who worry about something happening that they are going to be responsible for and that they haven't checked well enough. Uh, and uh, those are perhaps uh, the second most common form of this disorder. Other types include people who are afraid that things are not exact or just so or perfect, um, and it can manifest itself in many different ways. These people often are ordering and arranging their life to make things just perfect, or they might be checking all the time. Did they write the right thing? Did they say the right thing? It could even be checking in their head, which is a mental ritual, just reviewing over and over and over again conversations. Did I say just the right thing? Another big category of symptoms in OCD patients would be intrusive thoughts about um, sex or violent thoughts. Um, so intrusive sexual thoughts or violent images against other people. And Larry, I think you've had patients also who've had religious symptoms. And for all three of these, aggressive, sexual, and religious obsessions, the patient may not tell you, at least at first, because they're, they're more embarrassing, they're more afraid that you'll think they're crazy when they report these things to you. 
religious obsessions might be, did I offend God? Did I blaspheme? Do I deserve to go to church? And of course, this occurs in all religions, not any one particular religion. The other one we haven't talked about is people who um, have too much stuff and they've either sort of acquired it, they might acquire it from the dumpster or their neighbor's garbage, or they might be in the store buying too many things, multiples of things, and then they can't get rid of it. These are the people who are living like pack rats in their house with stuff all around them. They may not be able to use their kitchen or their bathroom because they've accumulated so much stuff and can't get rid of it. And in fact, OCD patients often don't just have one type. They could have several obsessions and several compulsions. The other thing about the definition of OCD is there's one specifier in the manual, mm -hmm. the DSM-4 manual, which is with poor insight. So this is here because it was thought historically that OCD people always knew that these thoughts and these behaviors were irrational. But in fact, that's not always the case. There's a small group of people who never know, that, or seem near delusional the about their symptoms from the beginning. And there are many other OCD patients where what they have is what I would call variable insight, which is in, their, in the office with you, they can say, gosh, it's nuts, I'm washing my hands all the time. But if you take them on the New York City subway, which is one of the things we sometimes do when we're do, working with our patients, in that moment they lose insight that it's not deeply dangerous to them. Well, the three of you specialize in OCD, so you see patients with these unusual conditions all the time, but how common is OCD in the community? It used to be thought that OCD was a rare disorder prior to 1982, occurring about in one in every 10,000. Uh, we now know from epidemiologic studies that the disorder is actually much more common than previously believed, occurring in about 1 to 2 percent of the general population, which means there's somewhere around 2.2 million Americans who are suffering from this disorder. The other important things about OCD, it seems to be in males as equally as the females. Um, it seems to be in all races and all ethnicities. Um, Unfortunately, it has a relatively early age of onset. So half the cases start by age 19, a quarter of the cases by age 14. And the course is typically chronic, waxing and waning. So what does that all add up to? That means not uncommon, early age of onset, chronic course. No wonder the illness is disabling. We talk about this issue of disability. What effects might OCD have on a patient's life? Like most disorders, it ranges in severity from mild to completely disabling. And people with OCD are more likely to be receiving disability income, being unable to work, than people in the general population. There are patients in our clinic, for example, who couldn't complete high school because of fear of contamination of the other by the other students. Or people who can't go to work because it takes them so long to leave the house that they can't be assured they get to work on time or people who can't function normally in a marital relationship, both the social aspects of it and the sexual aspects of it because of fears of contamination. So it can color every aspect and, and make life a misery. And even people who are functioning are married and working and there are many people with OCD who are doing that, a lot of times they're functioning below their potential because they're really having to compensate and cope for these symptoms on a daily basis. What causes OCD? Well, the simple answer is we don't know. Um, but we do know certain things. So we know that there's a genetic vulnerability, at least in some people. So there's a higher rate for people with OCD, um, their families with a higher rate of OCD in their family members. Uh, we also know from twin studies that monozygotic twins have a higher rate um, than dizygotic twins. So suggesting again a genetic vulnerability. Whether there's a specific genes associated with OCD, it's a t topic, a very hot topic of research. But not everybody has OCD in their family who gets OCD, so it's not the only answer. The second thing we know is we know for a long time people have wondered that, that have proposed that there have been serotonin abnormalities that cause OCD, and that's because the medications we use affect the serotonin system. But in fact, proving that there are serotonin abnormalities in the brains of people with OCD has actually been very difficult, and there are conflicting results. And there's a lot of interest these days on looking at other neurotransmitter systems like glutamate and dopamine.
But what we do know from brain imaging studies is that the brains of people with OCD have different activity patterns, thought to be abnormal activity patterns in specific brain regions. And that's led to a model of OCD as what OCD is, is a malfunctioning brain circuit, including areas of the brain like the orbital frontal cortex and parts of the basal ganglia and other brain regions as well. The other thing, I think, I, I think maybe you did this study, Steve, showing that roughly a third of people who have OCD say it began when something traumatic happened. My parents divorced, uh, my father died, I lost a job, I was under a lot of stress, and two-thirds of people say it came out of the blue. There was nothing particular going on in my life and it just sort of gradually began. Uh, and I don't know why it began. I think that's right, Larry. Uh, you know, another thing that's very uh, important, I think, to emphasize is, is that uh, we think of this as a brain disorder now. And for so many years, uh, people thought of this as just the disorder that was caused by uh, your upbringing or was caused by your family environment. And now I think that there can be no question, even though we don't know the cause, that uh, there is going to be something different about the way that uh, people with OCD circuits and the way that people uh, with OCD, how their neurotransmitters work. And it's just a question of getting to that. But I think in terms of reassuring patients that their disease is quite a bit like hypertension or quite a bit like diabetes uh, and nothing that they need to be embarrassed about is very important from a clinical perspective. So then the question becomes, in practice, how do you identify patients with OCD? Uh, maybe about 10 or 15 years ago, uh, we had the opportunity to look at the first 200 or so patients that had come into our clinic, and we developed a, a tool to try to help uh, uh, diagnose patients. And that tool is split up. It's called the L. Brown Obsessive Compulsive Scale. It's split up into uh, two sections. One, a comprehensive overview of the types of symptoms that patients experience and to a scale that allows you to be able to assess the severity of the illness based on the frequency of the thoughts and the compulsions and how much time they take up, how much distress they cause, uh, how much occupational uh, or social impairment they cause, and how much control they have over the obsessions uh, or the uh, compulsions. Uh, in practice, that scale perhaps is uh, not as um, used widely because uh, most of us who are practicing now see people in very short periods of time. It takes time. And uh, so one of the very important things to recognize, I think, is, is, is that this, in, something that we stress to our residents is that uh, this should be incorporated four or five simple questions into every routine mental status exam. And those questions include, uh, do you have thoughts uh, recurrent thoughts that come into your mind that you experience as intrusive, that don't make a whole bunch of sense, and that cause significant amounts of distress. Uh, second, do you have to check things over and over, or do you have to wash your hands excessively? Third, are you a perfectionist? Do you make lists? Do you try to uh, alphabetize things? Uh, do things have to be just so before you can move on to the next action? And then last, do you save things? These are the hoarders and have difficulty throwing things out. And if you ask those four simple questions uh, in your office, whether you're a psychiatrist or a um, primary care physician or a internist, you'll capture about 90% of patients with this disorder. Well, getting the diagnosis right is essential to providing the right treatment. We know that physicians like to learn from real cases, so let's meet Michelle from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, whose OCD was misdiagnosed at first. I can remember probably about eight or nine um, having to do everything symmetrical. Like, if I did something with this hand, I'd have to do it with the other one. And then when I was about 15, I started to get the symptoms that um, were more like paranoid symptoms, the symptoms about germs. My sister was in nursing school when I was going through my first uh, bad stage of OCD. I was about 16 or 17. 
she mentioned that she thought that I had OCD. She was afraid of food poisoning um, and germs specifically. And we know that it was hereditary. My father has it, my cousin has it, and I have an uncle with it. Was it soy milk or? Yeah, you should use my soy milk. I didn't have symptoms for a while, and when I was 23, they came back pretty bad. Uh, the colonel bag in one hand, the baby in the other. It was a fear that someone was going to put something in my drink, but then it progressed to the food. I didn't really think the people were poisoning me. It's the what if. I don't really think that someone's out to get me. I, in fact, I know they're not. It's just the what if they are. I decided to seek medical attention. Um, there was really no ifs, ands, or buts about it. I mean, I wasn't functioning at all. I wasn't eating. I was losing weight. I wasn't going out of the house. I wasn't sleeping. I was scared all the time. I was having anxiety attacks. I knew that it wasn't normal to think people were putting things in my food. When I checked myself into the hospital, they diagnosed me as schizophrenic. Um, delusional and paranoid. It was like somebody pulled the rug out from underneath of me and I was pretty much devastated. So from that point on, I was thinking that there was something terribly wrong with me and I was never gonna get better and it was very frightening. They gave me um, antipsychotics, which really did not do me any good. They actually did harm. It made me feel like everything was in a dream state. They just made my anxiety worse. I was in the hospital the second time. Eventually, I saw a doctor there, and he said, um, you don't belong here, you're not delusional, you've got OCD, and we need to get you into um, an intensive OCD outpatient. My intensive outpatient program was three days a week. I really look forward to my therapy. It was um, behavioral therapy. They treat with um, exposures and response prevention. I was there almost four months. Ready to play? It was really a relief to find out that I was misdiagnosed. Not that I want to have OCD, but the OCD I can learn to live with. And I know that there's treatment. I I think that with the behavior therapy and the medication, I started to see improvement little by little. My symptoms aren't all the way gone. The OCD is always going to be there. Life today is good. I went back to school, I've actually figured out what I wanted to do for a career. Um, so I'm working towards my CPA and um, just trying to live normal life and do things that I used to do. <laughs>
certainly we've had people who came to us labeled schizophrenic because the physician didn't have experience with OCD and the ideas were bizarre. But in fact, they don't have the other symptoms of schizophrenia, which can be a clue. They're, they're not affectively blunted. They don't have thought disorder, loosening of associations, difficulty uh, keeping on track. And OCD can also be confused with generalized anxiety disorder. The distinction being that in generalized anxiety disorder, people are worrying more about real life things. Is the boss going to yell at me? Will my car break down? Are my kids going to get sick? Why is my daughter not here? Was she in an accident? Whereas in OCD, people are worrying about not such realistic things like, is the desk contaminated and will I get sick if I touch it? Now, obviously, there are always these gray zones. We all could talk sure. about cases of sort of, you know, we talk in our clinics, hmm, is that GAD, is that OCD? Again, For one sure. of the things that we use is GAD people don't usually have rituals or compulsions. And so that it's, the, it's the constellation of symptoms together that make you say OCD. It's not a, sing, it's not, a single intrusive thought does not make you have OCD. A single repetitive behavior doesn't make you have OCD because that's the third category that people often get confused by is all the other disorders that have compulsions. The one that we often see which is sometimes difficult to make the distinction is Tourette's syndrome where people can have complex tics. I have to do multiple motions that can look like a compulsion but the the experience of this is different for the patient. It's not in response to an idea, it's not to prevent something bad from happening it's not to get rid of psychic anxiety. A complex tick is more likely to be preceded by something sensory. I feel uncomfortable. I feel like I have to move. I feel the urge to do something, but not for any particular reason. It's an uncomfortable feeling, and I'm not doing it to achieve an end. But in some cases, it can be difficult to make this distinction. Are comorbid disorders common in people with OCD? That's a great question. Unfortunately, they're very common. The ones that are most common are comorbid major depression and other anxiety disorders like social anxiety disorder or panic disorder or generalized anxiety disorder. But besides major depression or different types of depression and other anxiety, there are also less common psychiatric disorders that you often see go along with OCD. These would include the impulse control disorders, um, Tourette's or tic disorders, as well as attention deficit disorder. Um, so it's very important when you evaluate a patient with OCD that you be thinking about these other disorders that often come along with the OCD. And when you get ready to treat OCD, that you don't forget to also treat these comorbid disorders. Well, once the OCD is properly diagnosed, what are the treatment options? Well, the American Psychiatric Association recently published what they call a treatment guideline for OCD. Blair, in fact, uh, helped to write those guidelines, and Steve's research helped to inform those guidelines. And the guidelines say that the, the primary or first-line treatments include serotonin reuptake inhibitors and something called cognitive behavioral therapy and or the combination of those. They do not include tricyclic antidepressants or other kinds of antidepressants or MAO inhibitors, which are antidepressants. The serotonin reuptake inhibitors are antidepressants as well, but they're the only subgroup of antidepressants that are effective in OCD. So you have two primary treatment approaches, medications with serotonin reuptake inhibitors or cognitive behavioral therapy or the combination. May I make a clarification? Absolutely. Which is, so, you know, Larry's saying there, there's medica class of medications and this particular therapy, and he's talking about serotonin reuptake inhibitors, and we think of them as selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, such as fluoxetine, fluvoxamine, sertraline, paroxetine, oh. all FDA approved, exactly. as well as escitalopram and citalopram, which aren't FDA approved, but they're large trials suggesting efficacy. And he's saying, in general, the other classes of antidepressants don't work, but there's one exception, one tricyclic, which is called clomipramine, which right. turns out to be a very potent serotonin reuptake inhibitor, as well as a norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. And in fact, that was the first medication found effective in OCD. If you will, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, if you will, cleaner medications than clomipramine, were then also found to work in OCD and have less side effects, and so they've really become the first-line medication treatment. Since many patients will benefit from a combination of medication and cognitive behavioral therapy, let's learn more about that option from a patient of Dr. Rasmussen. Uh, Jeff is a husband and father in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. I'm a very creative guy, and I have an idea, I have a vision, 
I take out a piece of canvas and boom, there it is. I've never taken any lessons. I don't know how to paint, I don't know how to draw, and I just started. It's one of the few times that I'm, for the most part, symptom free. At the beginning of college, OCD it started to manifest itself. I played college sports at Ohio State and I had gotten jock itch and it just found its way into that and the paranoia of having it and worrying about it and then all the comfort issues around it and it took off from there. It found its way into all types of different things, whether it be checking the car door, making sure the stove was off, the things that uh, people think of typically when they think of checking in an in, in OCD. It's become more obsession type stuff, worrying about various things. You need to repeat things or rehearse things in your mind a certain amount of times uh, before it uh, will allow you to, to, to settle in and be calm and, 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 and have those bad thoughts go away. I thought I was going crazy. When I was 24, I went to Dr. Rasmussen. When I was diagnosed, I was relieved. There's a reason why this is happening to me. First thing was go on medication. I'd like to think that certainly helped. The medicine, you know, helps lower the anxiety so that you can do the other things that you need to do to get better. How are you? What's going on? How you doing? Okay, what's happening? How's vacation? Yeah, pretty good. Yeah, pretty good. Thanks good. for coming in. All right, let's, let's do it. All right. The behavioral therapy I started when I was 40. And that was excruciatingly difficult to do. I've done a very exceedingly poor job in, in doing that, but you know, the behavioral therapy is about exposing yourself to the things that you fear. And it creates an unbelievable level of uh, anxiety. The fear, Jeff, in a moment like that is that you're gonna be so preoccupied that what is gonna happen? It just all becomes, you know, it's like a snowball for me. Okay. By the time I saw him, he had multiple rituals associated with that fear. He had rituals about getting dressed. He had rituals about taking a shower. He had rituals about what underwear he could wear, how he would pack his underwear. And literally, he would think about that fear for several hours a day. But the first couple sessions that I did with Jeff was just to try to understand the nature of his symptoms and the nature of his illness. The more I can understand how it works for him, the more we can tailor the intervention specific to what he has. We did things that would directly expose him to triggers of his fear. Should you seek relief in some sort of statement to yourself about what you can or you can't do tonight? Well, when we had, you know, we had the, the tight rules all that time, this never came up. The mental review. Right. I use these exposure tapes where I'll listen to these potential bad things that I worry about and start to inoculate myself. He worries that if he has something on his mind, he's not going to be able to be there for his family. Uh, I'm going to find something to worry about that will keep me preoccupied and away from my children enjoying my weekend. By the time the rest of my family's getting up, I've already, you know, done something good for myself, exercised, done the exposure, and, you know, taken a, you know, a, a shot at the illness before, you know, it can, it can hit me. And the therapy is, you know, giving me an opportunity to, to proactively try to get myself better. Jim, thank you. I really, I owe you guys one? Okay, thank you. Appreciate your guys' work on this. When I paint, for whatever the reason, I get lost in my own little world. It's a great form of therapy. And I'm not going to allow the disease to rule my life or affect me from doing anything. There's no magic pill. I don't think it can just go away. You manage it the best you can. It's a battle, you know, but one that can be won. Rio, I've had the privilege of treating Jeff over a 15-year period. It's remarkable that someone who has his degree of symptoms is a successful CEO of a company, a devoted father. He paints, and he still struggles with his OCD every day. I think one of the things that's remarkable is what these patients have to go through on a daily basis. So, for example, 
uh, Jeff would tell me that the anxiety that he feels with doing something simple like checking the door, that that level of anxiety is like you were at an airport and suddenly you lost your three-year-old child. So that they connect very high levels of anxiety with things that most of us wouldn't think uh, twice about. And he goes through this every day. So after you watch this for 15 years, these people are an inspiration to those of us who treat them. Mm -hmm. Jeff's a perfect example of that. And someone who has done the best he can to use medication as well as cognitive behavior therapy to optimize his outcome. Dr. Simpson, can you explain more about the therapy Jeff is having? Absolutely. So cognitive behavioral therapy consisting of specific procedures called exposure and response prevention is what's proven to be effective in OCD. So it's a form of cognitive behavioral therapy but with very specific procedures that are involved in it. Um, what are those procedures? One is exposure, and what that means is you take an OCD patient, just as the therapist is saying on the tape, you really learn their world. What, what are the things that trigger their OCD? What are they actually afraid of? What's the worst possible outcome of what they fear might happen? And you make a hierarchy of those fears from zero to 100. Zero being doesn't make me anxious at all. 100 means most anxious I'll ever be. And what you do then is you design specific exposures around those stimuli, whether it's a thought or an actual place in the environment or even just an imagined consequence. And you start about halfway up and you ask them to expose themselves to that thought or to that place or to that fear in a very specific way, not just like casual life, but you take a scenario and you actually have them stay in that situation for a prolonged period of time until what usually happens is they, when they first are there, their anxiety spikes. But then as they stay there, the nervous system can't stay anxious forever. Just with time alone, the anxiety comes down and that's what you're after. You're after teaching them, you're after teaching their brain that actually that stimulus doesn't have to generate anxiety. Then you repeat it, and you repeat it a lot of times. And once they've got it, where they now can encounter that stimulus, and it just doesn't generate as much anxiety anymore because they've done it in a prolonged, repetitive way, you move up the ladder. And that's this sort of stepwise exposure part of the treatment. What's key, though, is the other procedure in parallel, which is the ritual prevention or response prevention. And that means you have to get the patient to stop doing all their rituals at the same time. So that's what you're seeing in the tape. There's techniques for how to do that as well. Um, I think the important thing is that exposures can be done two different ways. One is in the real world, someone with contamination fears. You actually, in New York City, we take them to the subway. We take them to Grand Central Station. We take them to the bathrooms in Grand Central Station. We've got a lot of stimulus. Right. You've got a lot of stimuli in New York City. But, but there's certain people, certain of their fears, they don't, you can't, for example, someone who fears if they don't turn the stove off correctly, they're going to burn the house down. You, of course, don't get them to burn the house down. Instead, what you make is a scenario, an imaginal scenario, where they leave the house, they don't check the stove, or they might not even turn the stove off for a period of time that they leave the house. Then they imagine that that now leads to the house burning down. Then it's that story that's placed on a tape. And again, done repetitively, the person listens to that same scenario identically, again and again and again, same procedure. Anxiety will spike when they first listen to that story, but by the thousandth repetition, the goal is the anxiety comes down all on its own, just with time. The other part of it is you really want to do it with someone who's skilled. This isn't, you, you know, this is a very specific set of procedures. It works when it's done correctly. It can be very effective as a standalone treatment for people with OCD. But if someone isn't doing the procedures right or the patient isn't able to do the procedures in between sessions, it's not going to work very well. Well, as you say, behavioral therapy can be very challenging. Jeff told us about his thoughts about the process. The exposure, you have to buy into it. It's a very difficult thing. Not everybody has the, the willpower or the, you know, the internal fortitude to do you know, what the doctors say, because basically they're telling you to, to, to live your worst nightmare. That's not a, a, an easy thing to do. Dr. Coran, are there patients who simply cannot do this type of therapy? Unfortunately, yes, Rhea. People who are too depressed to 
let their anxiety to, for their anxiety to extinguish when they do expose themselves or are too depressed to be motivated to confront these very distressing or anxiety provoking symptoms or situations may not be able to do this or may start it and drop out of therapy. They intend to do it, but they find it just too difficult. Let's look at how selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors fit into the treatment options. Which SSRIs will help with OCD? The treatment guidelines point out that the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors are first-line treatment. They all appear to be equally effective on a statistical basis. Roughly half, 40 to 60 percent of people will respond to any one. But for reasons we don't understand, some people need one and don't respond to another, and other people need a different one. And one can't, at this point in time, predict who's going to respond to which drug, which is unfortunate, because the trials to find out if the drug works for you last 8 to 12 weeks, 2 to 3 months. Are SSRIs used in OCD the same way they are in depression treatment? Not exactly. The American Psychiatric Association guidelines point out that you need frequently higher doses of SSRIs than in depression and a much longer treatment trial to determine whether or not this drug is going to help this patient. So one might start at the manufacturer's recommended dose or if the patient's nervous about taking medications or worried about side effects, start at half that dose or even less since many of these drugs come in liquid form. And then my practice is to raise the dose weekly or every other week to the highest dose the patient can comfortably tolerate and keep them at that dose for at least four to six weeks and a total treatment trial of eight to 12 weeks before deciding whether or not this medication helps this patient. We are referred patients from other providers frequently that come in and have had in what we would call inadequate trials. And the two most common causes of that are uh, patients who have had an inadequate dose and patients who have not been treated for a long enough period of time. So just to reiterate what Larry had to say, which is 10 to 12 weeks of being treated at a maximally tolerated dose of an SRI is the recommendation. And the guidelines also try to help physicians by pointing out what those higher doses might be. And the guideline has a table that indicates, for example, that one might use 400 milligrams of sertraline in OCD, whereas in depression the top dose would be 200 milligrams, usually. Or one might use 60 milligrams of escitalopram, where the dose would be 20, maybe 30 milligrams in depression. And for fluvoxamine, 450 milligrams, whereas in depression one would usually stop at lower doses. So the points are higher doses and longer period of time. I think there's a third difference between depression and OCD as well, which is in OCD what we're looking for is response, not necessarily cure. And what we mean by that is these medications typically cause an average reduction of symptoms by maybe 20 to 40 percent. And that's the third thing is you, the physician needs to not only know that that's what they're expecting out of these medications, but they also need to tell the patient that's what we're expecting so that the patient doesn't come in and say, hey doc, this medication isn't working simply because it's reduced the person's symptoms but hasn't made them all go away. Now having said that, we've all seen patients who've had a fabulous response oh. to a medication and in fact their symptoms have become minimal and we've unfortunately also seen patients who have no response at all but on average what we're looking for is a reduction in symptoms and that is a good response in OCD. And if the medication takes the edge off, maybe that's when the patient can do the work of cognitive behavioral therapy because now they're not so terribly anxious that they can't even imagine exposing themselves to uh, what they're doing. I think it's important to also recognize that the side effects come before the therapeutic benefit. Absolutely. And oftentimes many patients drop out early, Too early. if you don't follow them weekly or biweekly. And the acute side effects are frequently minor uh, amounts of nausea or diarrhea or problems with insomnia, those oftentimes dissipate and you can usually convince people if you see them regularly to kind of work through those side effects until the time uh, that you're going to see a therapeutic response. However, the longer term side effects that are most problematic are sexual dysfunction, weight gain, and fatigue and tiredness or apathy. And all three of those, I think you need to be thinking about a strategy as soon as you initiate pharmacotherapy as to if they do in fact appear, which they frequently do, 
Uh, what, are, what are the ways that you can minimize their impact on people's lives? Now, the first thing in terms of sexual dysfunction is that it's very important to discuss this openly with the patients. Steve, you're talking about several different kinds of side effects though, right? Loss of libido or loss of desire, as well as difficulty with orgasm, difficulty with erection. Yes, it's, that's, it's that's absolutely correct. And um, also weight gain is another very common thing. Uh, we tell our patients from the beginning to monitor their weight closely. And although it's uh, not something that has a direct effect that we know of on metabolism, uh, it is true that it causes increased craving for high carbohydrate foods. So uh, dietary counseling and trying to encourage people to get exercise and to uh, make certain that they watch their diet from the beginning can be a, a preventative um, thing that can work to help people uh, over the long run stay on their medicines. There are certain uh, approaches to sexual side effects that probably all of us use. Blair, how do you approach somebody who has that problem? You know, the one that I use the most often is decreasing the dose, which I find is the one that mm -hmm. actually affects, you know, benefits them the most. You know, there are a lot of other strategies like the addition of bupropion mm -hmm. or other medications. I find that usually, though, people don't like adding a lot mm -hmm. of medications on top. And sometimes if I can get away or we can get away with just reducing the dose, um, it doesn't usually lead to a huge loss of benefit in their right. symptoms for OCD, and it means functioning. You can keep them on the meds. What, what about drug holiday? Do you ever try that? So, so drug holiday, uh, for me, is one of the most effective ways to try to treat this. One of the issues there is, is you have to uh, take a drug that has a relatively short half-life, however. So something like fluoxetine doesn't, doesn't work, work as well exactly. uh, in these patients because of its long half-life. Um, but there are patients who can tolerate... Uh, going off on Friday, being able to have a normal sexual experience over the weekend and then resume their medication without uh, th the following Monday without uh, uh, problems in terms of efficacy. The one drug I won't do that with <clears throat> is paroxetine because there's a withdrawal syndrome that can start within 24 hours. But the other drugs I, I don't have a problem with. We have one more patient case to illustrate the treatment of OCD. Amy, a young woman from Corpus Christi, Texas, tried several different medication regimens before finding the right one for her. It was a big secret, a big hidden secret. The first time I noticed that I was having some OCD symptoms was in seventh grade. I remember sitting in my reading class and I thought the kid next to me was contaminated and after that class I would always go to the bathroom and wash my hands. At that time I didn't know it was OCD. It really started to impair my life during high school. It was just amazing the excuses that I would come up with to go change my clothes, go to the bathroom and wash my hands, take a shower. However, I was able to keep it hidden, surprisingly. When I first started college, that's probably when it got the worst, and I was probably washing my hands about 50 times a day, and I was doing laundry over and over and over again. I just started becoming really depressed. And I also realized that my OCD was just getting horribly out of control. I had gone to the counselor on campus. She immediately put me on some medicine and she discussed a medical withdrawal with me. And at that point I was like, no, no way I'm, you know, dropping out of school. That afternoon I went into one of my classes to take an exam and I couldn't even finished because I thought it was contaminated. And I just started crying in the middle of, of the exam. And I turned it in and I went back to my dorm and called my mom. And the next day we went back to that same counselor and again discussed the medical withdrawal and realized that that's really what I needed to do. I was really embarrassed about the OCD. Even though I knew it was a disorder, that it was a legitimate problem with my brain, I still couldn't help but think that everyone would think that I was weird. I've been on SSRIs, antipsychotics, 
and tricyclics, pretty much any type of antidepressant that you could think of, I've been on. There's some that I've had horrible side effects with. I was extremely shaky and I was getting hot flashes on one of them. Another one made me sleep for almost 24 hours straight. I was really sensitive. My doctor finally realized that I needed to be on lower doses. So now I'm on three different medications and it seems to be the, the proper concoction of medications for me. The medications have helped me with my OCD by preventing the really horrible obsessions. I'm gonna have a quiz on Friday too. Going back to college was really important for me and I never thought I was gonna move into a dorm again because of the trouble that I had initially but my therapist said that it would be a great exposure for me. Yeah, and they turned out good. I really do consider myself normal. I just still have obsessions. I still do some compulsions, but I am so much better than I used to be. <laughs> living my life again. I am my own person. I don't have to hide myself. I'm able to go out and do things socially. I was always afraid that I was never gonna find somebody who accepted me for who I was, which includes OCD. It is a part of me. I'm so lucky to have met my husband. He is so understanding with my OCD. Amy is wonderful. She is fearless about the way that she faces OCD on a daily basis. I'm not sure at all if I would have been able to cope and overcome a lot of the challenges that she's faced. There is a huge process that you must go through to get better from OCD, but it is absolutely possible. So Amy is now taking an SSRI, another antidepressant, and an atypical antipsychotic. How often will patients need to be on multiple medications? Well, unfortunately, Rhea, often. Amy is somewhere in the middle of the American Psychiatric Association's treatment guideline. Recall that it starts off with first-line treatments of either a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor or cognitive behavioral therapy or the combination. She's moved beyond that to somewhere in the second line treatments where they've added an augmentation strategy and it does sound like she did have cognitive, some cognitive behavioral therapy. So perhaps a quarter to a third of patients will require augmentation strategy and more than that fraction might require switching between one serotonin reuptake inhibitor and another. It's perfectly reasonable if someone hasn't responded to the first drug that's been tried to try a second one. Hopefully, if CBT is available, that will also be tried before moving into these more complex augmentation strategies that are second-line treatments. So I think a sort of a simple way maybe for a, a general provider to think about it is first-line treatments, ser selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or CBT. Let's say that selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor doesn't work at all. Try another. And if that doesn't work, maybe at that point there's a question of going on to clomipramine. Let's say the, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor works somewhat, but the person's still left with symptoms. Well, the two proven treatments is to add on cognitive behavioral therapy or to add on an antipsychotic medication. The step after that is where now you're in more the sort of research arena, right. and that's where probably a general practitioner or a psychiatrist who doesn't see a lot of OCD patients really should be getting a consultation to be able to help them figure out those next steps for their patient. How about an adequate trial, the length of an adequate trial of cognitive behavioral therapy to tell whether or not it's working for this patient? Well, typically we use up to 20 sessions, somewhere between 15 and 20 sessions, and that's really enough to see whether the patient is moving. Sometimes it's not enough for a patient to get to the place where they have minimal symptoms. So we might go longer, but we'd only mm -hmm. go longer if the patient's really engaged in the treatment and you have a sense of movement. So 20 sessions to see if it works, but more than that to get people to where they want to go. Well, when treatment is working, how long should it continue? 
Well, that's an important question. So let's say you're on medications and treatment is working for you. You know, given what we've told you about OCD and how disabling it is and how it can really muck up people's lives, we're hesitant to take people off treatment that's been working. And the APA practice guidelines recommend one to two years. And I really like to see my patients have a prolonged period of wellness so they can get their life back on track. Now, at the same time, there are times when people need to come off medication or want to come off medication. For example, a woman maybe, let's say, wanting to get pregnant. Um, and there, what we would recommend is ideally they have a period of real wellness, one to two first. years, on the medication first. And then if you're going to discontinue, it, discontinue the medication, you go very, very slowly when you have the time that you can do that. Sometimes what we use in clinical practice is we use cognitive behavioral therapy to help patients get off their medication. That's another strategy that we often use. Certainly, I've seen people who were able to lower their doses or get off drugs uh, with the help of cognitive behavioral therapy. And when I'm tapering somebody off an SSRI, I'm planning two to three months to do this, not two to three weeks. We've had a very rich and thorough discussion today about this subject matter. Uh, what would you say are the main take-home points for our viewers? Well, first would be that OCD is a common disorder that's under-recognized, that it's important, particularly when people come into your office with comorbid anxiety or depression, to ask them four simple screening questions. First, do they have intrusive thoughts that don't make sense, that are recurrent, and that cause distress? Second, do they have to check things over and over, or do they have to wash their hands excessively? Third, do they have to line things up or do they have to have things symmetrical or on the edge of uh, things in order to be able to move on to their next action? And lastly, do they hoard things? Do they save them and have difficulty throwing them out? I'd like physicians to recall that there are two first-line treatments probably equally effective on a statistical basis serotonin reuptake inhibitors and cognitive behavioral therapy and or their combination and that even if these are not effective enough or not effective there are other alternatives and that if a physician has tried one or two of the first line treatments it, it would be time to get a consultation from an expert and I'd like to say it's a great time to learn about OCD. There's a lot of exciting research about OCD, and we're likely to have a lot of new strategies over the next couple of years. So it's a really good time to keep your eye on the literature and be able to diagnose and treat this or disorder, but also to keep up to date as, the, as we move forward and new strategies become available. Well, in closing, I'd like to thank the three of you for participating in our discussion on diagnosing and treating obsessive compulsive disorder. And I'd like to thank you, the viewers, and hope that the discussion today will be helpful in advising your patients and making the best treatment decisions. Also, I encourage each of you to go to your computer, log on to discoveryhealthcme.com and take the post-test. Only takes a few minutes to earn free credit for this program. And if you'd like to see the program again, you can watch it online, download a podcast, or order a DVD. The graphics and references from the program are also available online. Finally, I'd like to thank the University of Virginia for accrediting this program, as well as Jazz Pharmaceuticals for providing the educational grant that made this program possible. Until next time, I'm Maria Blakey for Discovery Health CME.